All right, this is my first go at trying a live stream and also trying to do a live, a, a live a slideshow on it, a Google slideshow. That sort of black box you see in the bottom right-hand corner, that's that's my camera. I didn't want to use that, but I, there's no way I can avoid it. So, uh, well, that I can see. So, yeah, because I'd done one of these an hour the other day and it turned out nothing showed up on screen. So this is my second attempt at this, and I just want to share with you about gut dysbiosis. There's lots of theories going about, but I recently discovered this uh, this person, Dr. Norman Robillard, with his theory. And uh, for me, I think it's the best theory I've heard. Maybe it's not going to work for everyone. What I mean is the best theory for me. Really, and uh, I'll show you this theory for because it's pretty simple. Go back there. The Western diet too much fermentation, e.g., carbs and fiber, and that's sort of the opposite of what we're being taught by the by everyone, by mainstream health, by uh, and a quick watch to fit. So I'll go. I'll go through this. Dr. Norman Robillard, so if you've got any gut problems, including things like uh, acid reflux, which is what Dr. Norm had, and what all this, and, um, but you could have anything wrong with your gut, you know, if you're thinking it's saying to do with gas pressure, so you could have acid reflux on one end, and you could have gas at the other end, you know, anything in between, because uh, if you're bloating too much. This is for people that bloat, really. Um, although I think that some people have fermentation that don't bloat, but really, if you bloat, for sure, I think you're looking at this sort of sort of uh, idea. So, Dr. Norm, I discovered him about three weeks ago, so I've only listened to him a bit. Um, he's got his own website, the Digestive Health Institute website. He's got his own app, the Fast Track app, which helps you with the diet it's based on. And, uh, yeah, really everything he says sort of fits for me, you know. So uh, I've really only been trying his diet three or four weeks. I mean, my bloating's gone down, but not as much as I would like, you know. Um, but, yeah, so I discovered him this year, 2024, and I think it was from this video, which was an excellent video. How to fix gut dysbiosis, SIBO, SIFO, LIBO, and EMO. That's what they're calling them at the moment. Small intestine bacterial overgrowth, small intestine fungal overgrowth, large intestine bacterial overgrowth. Most of them don't really think of that at the moment, you know, even in the enlightened, non mainstream part. Because you've got three parts in your system you've got the, the mainstream system, which is always decades behind usually you've got enlightened non-mainstream and then you've got sort of main, uh, non-mainstream that do their own thing you know like uh, I'm not saying they're wrong right or wrong like herbalists and things you know that sort of doing their own thing so LIBO uh, not too many of enlightened think that's true at the moment I would actually call it as well large intestine wrong mix of of a microbiome. So it might not be overgrowth, it might be just the wrong mix in the large intestine. And emo, which is intestinal methanogen overgrowth. Methanogens are archaea, they're not bacteria. And this is a relatively new theory about, say, 10 years or whatever. That some people can have archaea overgrowth and they got their light bacteria and they produce a lot of methane and that can also, I think, produce gas and that. But for some reason, they're, they're accepting that will be a lot from the large intestine, mainly, not the small intestine, although you can have it there as well. Yeah, I'll go on about this later. But anyway, this is the sort of place we are. People who read about these will know about them. So about Dr. Norm himself, he was he was a microbiologist, you know, and he worked in all aspects of bacterial stuff, you know, uh, not just to do with humans, to do, you know, 
to see plants, any anything to do with bacteria, wherever they live, because of course bacteria is everywhere. Uh, he was into that, but for for about twenty years, from when he was aged about say twenty to forty or a bit older, um, he had as really bad acid reflux. You know, it really ru ruined his life for him. He was saying. And then someday, when he was in his 40s, his adult son said to him, suggested, I think he was going on a fitness drive, and he suggested a low-carb diet. Um, and what what uh, Dr. Norm found was after about two days on a low-carb diet, his acid reflux disappeared, you know? So that's really got him what he was thinking on to this. It's an amazing story, really. He tells it a lot of ways. He's on YouTube a lot. He's very YouTube friendly, so that's good. Not only his own channel, but uh, on other people's to do with cyber and things like that, dysbiosis. So he's very open spreading his message, you know. Uh, so he done that, he, and he, he got rid of his own acid reflux. So he was thinking about it, and then he, then he because he was a microbiologist, he realized that fermentable carbs produce a lot of gas and so he was wondering well is it a gas from the bacteria eating my poorly digestive carbs or fermentable carbs is that what it is and uh, that's what he's thought ever since so that's his theory really that ferment we eat too many fermentable carbs it gives us dysbiosis and we get all sorts of problems because of it and the way to solve it is uh, to keep a, a low fermentation diet, a low of those fermentable carbs. I would say, personally, I would say avoid fermented stuff as well, but that's just my opinion. I don't know if he agrees with that, you know, like yogurt and probiotics and uh, sauerkraut. Definitely in the early months, anyway. I think for that diet, they're taking it for 12 Weeks. Not Dr. Norm, I just mean the ordinary side of that. Um, I think Dr. Norm feels that follow his for that he wanted. So he went on and he eventually thought of it was gas in the intestine, the, dis the, dis the gas caused by carbs. And so for the last 20 years, he's promoted that. Yeah, his main site is digestive health. And, and He's got a fermentation potential app, tells you the fermentation potential of foods and how much you're going to eat in grams. And he calls it the fast track diet. So if you look for that on Android or or Apple, you should find the app. I think it's about seven pounds, so about ten dollars, something like that. And they'll go on to his theory. Yeah. The Western diet has too much gut fermentation caused by too much carbs and fibre. I don't know if fibre is a carb. Is that not? Anyway. Yeah, that's his theory. And that's sort of the opposite of what we're being taught, you know, because we're being taught we need to eat more fibre and more complex carbs. We need more for a, for a good microbiome. But he's actually saying we're probably overfeeding that. And I, I feel I agree. I agree with him. You know, at the moment, I was coming to that concept myself as well from experiences of like, drinking Yakult and things like that. Because Yakult makes me really ill. Not just one go, just when I'm taking it daily. I can feel it sort of creeping up my neck, sort of migraine pain, or whatever you want to call it. I think it's just, I am actually giving myself delactic acidosis, you know, and that's what sort of made me think, well, maybe probiotics and all that aren't good for me either, you know? Yeah. So anyway, his theory is, I'm just making this bit up, by the way, because I couldn't remember the figures. Say we take about 125 grams of fermentable stuff at the moment, you know, because that can be stuff like, like sugar alcohols and uh, diet fizzy drinks, you know, like sorbitol or whatever. Um so any fermentable stuff, not just complex carbs like pasta, pizza, insoluble fibre. And he says it should be like 25 to 40 grams we should be taking, really. 
depending on how bad your bloating is. I suppose if there's nothing wrong with you, you don't need to bother about this, you know what I mean? If you think there's nothing up with you, you don't need to bother about this at all. This is for people who feel they've got some type of dysbiosis. And he was saying as an example, I don't know if I've got this right again, something like 30 grams of basmati rice or Uncle Ben's rice produces 10 litres of gas. You know, that gives you some idea. I mean, if you can imagine 10 litres of gas in a balloon, you know, and that's what, just start with putting your gut, and probably most people are eating more than that, uh, especially with ready meals and stuff, but during the day, you're probably grazing and eating pasta, you know, lots of stuff, lots of carby stuff. Uh, and so, let's see, he regards his protocol as a sort of permanent diet. He thinks it's healthy enough for a permanent diet, you know, because a lot of these other SIBO diets, because that's where the sort of area you'll end up looking at, SIBO, IBS. They're sort of meant to be short-term things that are meant to sort of get you back. Thing me. I, think I hear a lot of people say SIBO. I think Dr. Mark Hyman suggested 12 weeks for the SIBO diet. You know, that's not this diet. That's another diet. Uh, yeah, because... And then... He's trying to put the microbiome on the diet, not the person. So he actually lets you eat anything, I think, really. But if you're eating the sort of stuff with a high fermentation potential, he thinks you should keep it low. <laughs> or avoid stuff. Or swap it for other stuff that you could. Because apparently jasmine rice has got a fermentation potential of zero, whereas basmati rice and uh, white rice or even brown rice probably... Yeah, brown rice is more, less easy to digest than that. So that's like 24 fermentation points, which is one of the highest I saw in his list. I've not seen his whole list yet because I'm not very up. Um, so he's suggesting that maybe the problem in many of the dysbiosis category. I think everybody should be looking at this, you know, who feels like IBS, SIBO, acid reflux, um, you know, all these things, the constipation all these sort of things. And, yeah, an interesting point is he believes in LIBO, which is large intestine bacterial overgrowth. You could call it choline, choline overgrowth or choline dysbiosis. That would be two different things. It could be the same, but he's seen that probably a lot of people have got too much overgrowth in their large intestine. Mainstream medicine don't really believe that. No, don't believe that at all. Uh, enlightened, non-mainstream, a lot of them never talk about it either. It's never listed on SIBO sites or not often. So a lot of them still don't think of that. I think it's actually the root of the problem. I think most people, it's starting off in the colon with overgrowth or dysbiosis and then it's moving up to the small intestine. Or it might even just stay there and be bad enough. But I think that's what's happening, really. Especially if you get a bloated, bloated gut. You know, if you get a bloated gut, there's something wrong. Um, so what's he saying? Especially if you think it's to do with diet. Or yeah. So short intestine bacterial overgrowth, no, small intestine bacterial overgrowth, small intestine fungal overgrowth. See, I believe in large intestine fungal overgrowth as well. I don't know if anyone else does. Maybe not even Dr. Norm. Um, but I believe you probably could get candy, mainly candida albicans. That's the main type of fungal overgrowth we get. I mean, we've all got a bit of fungus in our, in our gut, but not mine. It's maybe well under control, but once it gets out of control. So I think you can get that in the large intestine as well, but even Dr. Norm doesn't mention it at the moment. Then this sort of new one, intestinal methane overgrowth. So the cyber community are accepting that this could be the large intestine and probably is mostly, but it can be up in the small intestine as well. So I believe in that. So that, that would mean if you wanted to take a test for that, you'd probably need to test a lot longer than 90 minutes, which is usually what a cyber test is because it takes about sort of 60 minutes for your food to, get, to leave your small intestine to move into your colon 
maybe 60 to 90 minutes, you know, if you eat a meal, eat from a big meal or whatever. So I would guess you'd need to test longer than that after a meal. Um, so it's good to understand to accept that. I think the, the non-mainstream enlightened community believe they take as a reference point for Cybo as the work done by the Pimentel Lab in Los Angeles, the, the university there, Kelly. California or whatever. The Pim- it's led by Dr. Mark Pimentel. Um, he's been doing a lot of work on this for 20 years, 25 years. And so he's the sort of reference point for small intestine bacterial overgrowth. He also believes in the test no, methane overgrowth. I think maybe even he was the one that sort of put the idea forward. And he's also put an idea forward when you look out for hydrogen sulfide bacteria overgrowth as well. Uh, so far they said it in about 10% of cases that he tests that are cyber positive, something like that. Or maybe I, that was Candida I was talking about, because I think he believes in Candida, but he doesn't seem to test for it yet. He, he's got a trio smart test, and I think he's the only one known to test for hydrogen sulfide at the moment. Um, but it's really expensive, so and you've got to send a sample to the lab and I, I don't know. I mean, to me, if you want to test for cyber now, you should be looking at uh, the food marble, food marble uh, device that you can use from home. At the moment, you can test for hydrogen and um, methane as in your saliva. And I think that's one of the main culprits he thinks a uh, good good uh, fermentable carb amylose and it's in rice and things a lot, not jasmine rice. Um, so he says to chew food a lot, you know, 20 times, I think he said, you know, that sort of thing. It's the sort of thing your gran would have told you. Um, turns out gran. And just a final, uh, I mean, it's similar to food. What I've, I don't actually know what a food map tie has, so, but it's not the same. Um, I've said I've heard somebody say that it's easier than the FODMAP diet. I think FODMAP means f- fructose, oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, something else protocol, uh, and you're basically avoiding a lot of sugars, but not all f- fermentable sugars that Dr. Norm's uh, diet has. So, yeah, so he's calling it a fast track diet, which isn't a great name in my opinion because I don't. Really I mean, it's really, you know, there's only, I would have called it something like the low fermentation diet or something, you know. It's the only diet that limits all five fermentable carb groups. Okay, I'll go into that later. I'll give you, I'll let you see that. Uh, I'll just, I'm going to try and find, uh, I've put here somewhere. Yeah, this is the five sugars. So I'll try to, the five sugars, lactose. Uh, some have malabsorption of that, not not everyone, but some. So lactose, uh, you can actually get lactose, lactose-free milk in that if you did want to drink milk. Uh, I wouldn't myself, but if I did, I would drink lactose-free milk just in case. Then it's in fructose, I'll go through them all, resistant starch, fiber, and sugar alcohols. So fructose, he says many have malabsorption of fructose. And fructose, even though it's quite a simple sugar, it's quite hard for us to break it down, apparently. So probably quite a lot of this down. So if you're drinking stuff like smoothies and you don't feel so good, you know, uh, that's a fructose high. Um, so this is a bit disappointing, you know, because probably you don't want to keep fruit quite low, but I think there's some that he's listed that are lower than others. I think he listed strawberries is quite low, say a bit fermentation potential of seven, whereas something like a banana was like 20 or something. Uh, I think you really need to see the diet, the fermentation potential up to, you know. But then once you do, you should be able to think that. I think there are quite a few fruits. It does suggest you can think me All right. Um, resistant starch. I think that's things like pasta, rice. You know, things that may be good for us, actually. And I think he means mainly the amylose-containing ones. Um, because that's a sort of 
carb is very quite hard to break down alcohol and digest and all the bacteria or archaea or fungus and it behaves like fibre basically he's saying so I suppose that's how we're being told it's good for us uh, fibre they said I don't know this I don't know about insoluble fibre because that's I thought nothing could feed off that you know because they just went through unchanged but don't quote me on that at all definitely soluble fiber and for now i'm guessing insoluble too so if you've taken fiber or whatever and you feel bad you know that might be to do with this year they've got bacterial overgrowth or yeah see that's one thing that's frustrating about the candida diet candida says to avoid simple sugars but you can take you can take a uh, more complex sugars like rice and that and wholemeal stuff and fiber and i've always felt really bad in those diets and this is probably why rather than killing stuff off i was probably feeding stuff you know i thought i was trying to kill fungus instead i was probably feeding bacteria maybe even archaea and then the other one is sugar alcohols and this was new to me and this was pretty depressing because i didn't know what these were what sugar alcohols I think it's sort of sweeteners, you know, things like that. It's sort of prebiotics. It turns out these things are, we're not very good at you know, digesting them, whereas bacteria are very good at digesting them, and fungus, no, not, I don't know about fungus, but, but it's things like sorbitol, you know, all these things. Because for a long time I've been taking low sugar or sugar-free fizzy drinks, thinking I'm doing myself great because I'm not feeding anything because I'm not taking sugar. Whereas it turns out I was probably feeding them really big time, you know, the bacteria and that. Because those things have got stuff like sorbitol in them. He says there's one good at sugar alcohol, ephra. I'll tell you later, because this is in another page. And I've got some examples here down the bottom. Yeah, we've got white, brown, and basmati rice as an example he says that's a fermentation potential of 24 which is one of the highest i saw because that's quite hard for humans to digest but for bacteria they'll digest it no bother uh that's why it's maybe good for us except jasmine which he says is zero so that means you could if you want to eat rice you could swap jasmine totally the thing about his diet is I think it's a high glycemic diet because basically it's based on the opposite of the high of the glycemic diet, where you're trying to avoid high blood sugar, you're trying to avoid simple sugars coming straight into your bloodstream. So, for people with diabetes or uh, glycemia or anything like that, this would probably be a, quite a bad diet, I would guess. So. Maybe we're going to have to come up with another strategy. Uh, for the rest of us, I'm guessing Jasmine's pretty well digested by humans. So, and he says it's zero. So, I don't know, but that's amazing because that means you could, if you do take a rice with a meal, you could take Jasmine all the time, which is quite a common one. Um, probably to a nutritionist, it's, it's the most frowned upon, you know, ironically. And then sweeteners, so this was disappointing because I thought sweeteners, oh, I'm doing all right here, but it turns out like stevia, all these things, and they're all probably feeding my overgrowth, so they've been bad for me. The only one they says is good is erythritol, and so I think that's got a very low, maybe even zero for fermentation potential. So that's something you can work around to make, give them sweeten up your thing. But personally, what I'm taking from this thing is, is that simple sugars are okay to an extent, you know, like glucose or not so much sucrose, because I think that's part glucose, part fructose. Um, uh, but probably better than sweeteners, because that's probably, we don't digest them at all, probably. Um, I'm talking about fermentation potential. So probably you could take stuff like glucose, uh, uh, the extras because people that go on that SIBO elemental diet which is the strictest of the SIBO diets they take glucose or some very simple sugar 
amino acids rather than protein. I, I, I don't know, they take, did they take some sort of fat as well? They must. Uh, but what they're trying to do is they're trying to make zero fermentation diet, that is, really, almost. Because you're... It's your upper small intestine where most of the digesting absorption takes place. So if you've got small intestine bacterial overgrowth, the small intestines may be pretty bacteria free because any bacteria there is competing with you for your food. But uh, you do have a bit down at the lower end of your small intestine. So lactic acid, only a bit though, because people with short testing keep getting lactic acidosis that's people who have got a short testing i mean very few have that and you'll you'll have been told something you're born with really you know and they keep getting delactic acidosis and they end up in the emergency room it could kill them it can be fatal delactic acidosis because it's different from the lactic acid that you build out when you exercise that's l lactic acid and that's easier for your body to remove. It's not that easy if you, you know, if you know yourself the next day how bad you feel. That's ill lactic acid. But with this D lactic, it's even harder for the body to metabolize. So if you're if you're doing anything that's creating a lot of D lactic acid in your body, you're gonna feel bad like I did with Yakult, basically. And I felt that way with all the you know, actamel. I felt it with all those sugar shots those yogurt shots, probably I get it from uh, yogurt as well. I think uh, the fast track diet suggests that you can take plain yogurt, but I wouldn't personally. I'm, I'm avoiding anything that's too acidic. Uh, it's too fermented foods. I'm not just, I'm not just keeping low the ones that are, uh, you know, get carbs that feed bacteria in your gut. I'm missing anything that's get, it's low acid, like apple cider vinegar, anything that's fermented, sauerkraut, kefir, you know, these sort of things. Yeah, so I'm, I've put fermented foods there. I don't know if he agrees with that. Uh, fibre, I think he agrees with that. Uh, I don't know about insoluble fibre and complex carbs. Well, they're the, they're the main culprit, really, I would have thought. You know. They mean sweeteners, it turns out, you know. I don't know. Yeah, here's some interesting points, but maybe they're not that interesting. In fact, the two lower ones are a bit... I think he said we don't need carbs. We can live without carbs. I, I mean, I don't quote me on that. I'm getting them wrong here or whatever. Because the three main foods are carbs, fats and protein. If we need fats and protein, he's saying we don't need carbs because we can sort of get our energy and that from the others. But for most people, of course... Uh, well, carbs are probably nice, but also if you're doing a lot of exercise and that, probably you want a lot of uh, quick energy, you know. I don't know if it's just the energy we get from carbs, you know. But uh, that's the sort of thing he was saying. Yeah. And then it's fast-track diet, which is Dr. Norm's diet. It's the only a diet that limits all five fermentable carb groups. So although there's a lot of cyber diets, but his is the only one that that limits all five fermentable carbs. I don't know about the ele elemental diet, because I think that almost everything's filled out of that, you know, but, uh, you know, but I think he said that, don't quote me on it, because I've just, I've, I'm doing this in a state of excitement, because I only discovered them about two weeks ago, and uh, I've only listened to about six or seven uh, things about them, quite a lot on his, YouTube channel. So I've not totally absorbed what he's saying, which is a bit ironic when we're talking about unabsorbed stuff. So but I'm too excited, I have to tell you, because really to me, he seems a sort of the one that's totally on the ball, absolute closest to what makes sense to me. So he's a sort of guru at the moment for me, you know. Uh, okay. And what was the other thing I said there? Cows don't get their nutrition from grass. Yeah, I just, I was fascinated when he mentioned this. Like, when you see a cow eating grass, it's not actually eating it for itself. It's eating it for its microbiome. And then they, they produce short-chain fatty acids, and that's what makes the cow healthy, basically. So if you took all the microbiome out of a cow, it would die. 
because it, it, no matter how much grass it eats, it can't do anything with it because it, it's not got the digestive enzymes to do anything with it. It's actually the bacteria, and it's got, I think cows have got about five different chambers in their uh, gut. We've got three. We've got the stomach, which is a small preparation room, really. The food will be out there within 15, 20 minutes. That's probably, you know, when you feel that stuff's left after you've eaten. It's just left your stomach, really, probably, and moved into your small intestine. The small intestine will probably stay in there till about... Uh, well, maybe 60 minutes, depending on how big a meal is, how complex it is. So, uh, yeah, that, that's maybe quite microbiome-free, except maybe the bottom but because any bacteria or fungus in there would compete with you for the food and produce their own metabolites, which are probably toxic, you know, or not always, but sometimes, you know. Uh, so we've got a small intestine and then we've got a valve and then it goes into the large intestine, the colon, which is down by your appendix and then it goes up, across and down and down to your rectum. So another valve. Thing. So we've got four valves. We've got the one between your esophagus and stomach, the valve between your stomach and small intestine, one between your small intestine and your colon, and one between your colon and your rectum, or whatever. Um, yeah, that, I just thought that was interesting about cows, you know. So, yeah, well, I'm not so interested now, but I guess sheep are the same. And so this is just these acronyms, I'm just pointing them out. Um, small intestine bacterial growth over growth. This is, mainstream medicine believes in that, so it's not so bad. I, I think mainly in the last 20 years, but if you went to your doctors and said you had a, a grumbly stomach or whatever, you probably wouldn't guess. He wouldn't, probably wouldn't order, he or she, sorry, or they. They probably wouldn't order a, a SIBO test, even though that's the first thing you should do, really. Uh, for that, you need to go to a hospital. And they might send you a bag out to blow into, but it's a bit of a nuisance. You can now get an app from, uh, not an app, a device from Food Marble who are based in Dublin. They've got a device that you can test at home. Um, of course, I don't know how accurate it is. I would hope so, but uh, I would buy it anyway just to so they keep going and get better and better, you know. Uh, small intestine fungal over overgrowth, uh, mainly candida. You'll hear people talk about they have candida and stuff. I would consider this if you get any obvious fungal signs, thrush, anywhere, you know your private area or even your tongue or your anus or skin if you've got a what do you call it fungus you get athlete's foot you know or you know anything on your skin and anything like that if that then you probably have do have a fungal problem in your small intestine maybe your large intestine as well um yeah so i would consider that maybe i would try and do both you know try and but I think maybe bacterial or archaea is the main problem that most people have, especially if they're not getting any f signs of fungus or whatever, you know. Uh, intestinal meth methane overgrowth, methanogens, which is archaea, not bacteria. And uh, Dr. Pim and Tom's lab believe that that's probably large intestine mostly, but they can get up to the small intestine. I mean, the small intestine test, breath test, Really, they only test you for 90 minutes, I think. And by then, they expect your small intestine to be clear. So anything after that is coming, being produced from the bacteria.